Welcome to another edition of the Insider Mailbag. I'm Jared Johnson, and as you can imagine, with all the uncertainty uh, this week, I received a lot of questions. There's some really good questions from uh, Inside the Riveter subscribers, as always. So with that, I'm going to jump right into them and see what we have here. First one comes from uh, Grand Blah, uh, who also always has colorful and interesting uh, comments and questions uh, on the Insider. He says he wants to get off topic a little bit uh, and ask about targeting. He says, if the defender lowers his head and makes contact with offensive player above the shoulders, it's targeting, correct? Yes, it is. Uh, but he said, watching football every week, weekend, especially in the NFL, uh, he sees offensive players lower their head and initiate contact. Why is that not offensive targeting? He said he's just wondering. It's a good question. It It is targeting. And I've seen it called before. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the NFL. I definitely have seen it with Ezekiel Elliott where he's been uh, called for targeting um, while running with the ball. Uh, you know, I think Josh Jacobs, I saw him truck a Atlanta Falcons uh, player. You know, Josh Jacobs with the, the Vegas Raiders uh, ran over a dude for Atlanta where he lowered his head and hit him right in the head. It was it was definitely targeting. I actually don't know if they called it or not, but it, by the letter of the law, it was. And You know, I think what really stood out to me from Texas Tech season was against Kansas State. There was a couple of hits from, and they were physical, hats off to Kansas State for being physical. I think that was the difference in the game was how physical their secondary was compared to Texas Tech's. Um, but there was a couple of them that seemed like targeting. And, and you know, Rico Jeffers was ejected for targeting in that game. And I think it was by the letter of the law, but not any more than what some Kansas State defensive backs were doing. And they were called. So I don't, I, I don't think anyone truly knows how to call that consistently. Or we would see it. Um, there's so much open for interpretation within that call that it makes it a judgment call. It makes it subjective uh, for these refs. So while I have no problem critiquing refs, criticizing refs, that one's that's got to be really tough. That's like the block charge in, in basketball. So uh, I understand the frustration. I wish they. I mean, I understand the targeting call. I understand why they do it. But I, you know, just the how soft the game is has become compared to what it was in the past. It's just a different game. So I hate the only the rule I really hate is the blind side block penalty, you know, where as long it's straight up, but if somebody doesn't see it coming, well, have your head on a swivel. There's a reason uh, that that's a that's the same is because, you know, you need to be aware. And if somebody's coming to look you up and you're and you're not paying attention, you should get lit up. I always thought that was a really good lesson that football taught you about life. But uh, different era, different way of looking at things, and they're just trying to keep it to where they're allowed to play, <laughs> I think. That's why they have all these rules. But good question, Grant Blaw. All right, the next one comes from Texan44. He says, other football programs that are uh, perhaps worse or in a worse bind than Texas Tech. He said he wants he wants me to make y'all feel better in that regard. Well, I think the team you just beat, Kansas, is in a worse spot. Uh, they have less talent. They have a deeper hole in terms of the roster. Um, I mean, how do you sell Kansas football right now? You know, I mean, you're winless. Uh, you're, just, you're just not a very good program. So I think... You know, well, Tech is in a better situation than Kansas. It's not even close. Rutgers is another team that comes to mind. They're in terms of Power Five, that's all I'm thinking about. They're you know a really rough program. So those are the first two that just off the top of my head come to mind. I think there are more, but uh, those are the two Power Five where I'm just like, there's no doubt to me that I don't even want to hear an argument that Tech's in the same bind as both of those two programs. Reverter K says, in my opinion, what changes need to be made in the athletic department and football program so that uh, Tech can win eight or nine games uh, consistently? Well, I, I think eight wins a season is realistic for Texas Tech with a good coach and a good coaching staff. Now, whatever's been going on in the last decade obviously has not been working. Let's put it that way. I definitely think, obviously I've said on Inside the River Raiders, I believe there will be a coaching change. Um, and I've listed my reasons why. Of course, you can see that in the uh, hump day chat if you haven't already. Um, but I think no matter what happens, with what we saw, I felt like the decision to keep Kingsbury a couple more seasons and the decision to hire Wells was largely a decision by Kirby Hoka. And 
look, those decisions backfired big time. So for all the good things he's done, and I'm definitely in the camp of that, look, he's been a very good athletic director, but he hasn't obviously done a very poor job with football, which is, I can't believe I'm saying that, but we look at the national championship in track, baseball going to the College World Series, like, you know, you almost expect it every year. And then, of course, Texas Tech basketball coming within seconds of claiming a national title there. And that's not even to mention all the other sports, which, I, you know, I don't know how many of you out there care about those other sports. Some care about every athletic sport, uh, you know, Texas Tech sport. But uh, some people just, you know, really care about football and baseball or football and basketball or something like that. Um, if you only really care about football, then you don't want to hear what I'm saying here. But if you do care about other sports, then... Uh, Kirby Hoka has done a good job, but you, there's just look at the stats. This isn't like an opinion of mine. If you look at the record, I mean, the fact that Texas Tech hasn't had a winning record since 2015, Texas Tech hasn't had won a bowl game since 2013, and hadn't posted a winning record in the Big 12 since 2009, tells you all you need to know about the lack, lack of success from the football program. And the most recent hires and hiring and firing decisions – have been almost or been very largely done just by Kirby Hoka, the athletic director. I mean, you would think that moving forward, there would be more of a group uh, decision and uh, coaching search, whenever that is, whether it's right now, as I've said, I believe is going to happen, or next year or three years from now or whatever. I would like that you ask me my opinion. I don't want him doing the lone wolf McQuaid deal again because I don't think it hasn't lent results yet and I don't think it would uh, in the future. Nas Raider asks, he says on the David Ghost issue, offensive coordinator, he says this offense hasn't looked like what we expected based on what Wells and Yo said they wanted to do and on Yo's past offenses. Uh, has he lost his mind and forgotten what worked for him in the past or is this a QB position uh, at Tech hindering his ability to do what he wants to do? I think it's both. When you have an offense that performed as poorly as Tech did this past season, and it was one of the worst seasons um, in Red Raider, let's say in the last 20 years of Red Raider football by an offense. Now, look, Texas Tech has ridiculously high standards when it comes to offensive football. Um, obviously, Mike Leach and the Air Raid put up just monster numbers. Even under Tuberville, they still, I mean, did – relatively well and then under Kingsbury I mean you put up video game numbers you had one of the really bright minds in offensive football with Kingsbury and then arguably the best quarterback of the generation in Pat Mahomes uh, not to mention some guys like Jakeem and Dre and Will Raven and Kiki all those guys just very very talented Amaro I mean during the Kingsbury era that's some really good weapons and good things going on and I mean this 2020 was a far cry from that. And I'll tell you what, Bowman is just, to me, not a good fit, and I'm not sure how good he is. He's just not consistent enough. Um, he'll have a good game, but then he'll just be terrible. So we'll see what happens there with uh, Alan Bowman. But then also we'll see what happens with David Yost, because if, I say if, Wells comes back, it's my belief that it'll be without Yost. And I don't think Wells wants to do that, but we'll see. Um... I, the offense became unbelievably predictable. By the the five, I've said this in a bunch of places at this point, but by the game against Kansas, I mean, I was calling out half the plays. Uh, and you know the defensive coordinators in the Big 12. If I'm able to do it, they're able to diagnose it, and they know where the ball is going, what they're doing. So that's not good. You know, that's a big part of the game is just predictability. And this isn't – Tech doesn't have the athletes to just line up and run say, this is what we're doing, and you can't stop it. That's, that's not the case at Texas Tech uh, right now. So, I, you know, I, in my opinion, I think Tech will go a different way with offensive coordinator and quarterback. And I think there's a good chance that will lead, lead to improved play next season. All right, Recycler asked me the question. He says, uh, should Wells and staff get one more year? Give my, the reason for my answer. Yeah, you know, I was prepared going into the season that no matter, almost no matter what happened. Never say never, right? Learning this in this business and this year in this crazy life, this this uh, world of ours right now, uh, never say never. And this was a perfect case because, 
I really thought, look, two years is just not enough time. Just philosophically, I don't believe that's enough time, especially the situation Matt Wells inherited. And I thought, in my opinion, I think he's done some really good things with the roster in terms of improving a really bad situation. So that's actually on the uptick in terms of improving the roster. I like it. You have early signing period coming up just starting Wednesday, and they're going to sign all 10 of their commits. They're, they're supposed to, at least last time I talked to the commits. Um, so... You know, and, and those are highly rated guys. Although almost all of those guys, at least I think nine of them, are guys that had offers from other Big 12 schools and several Big 12 schools. So you like what they're doing there. But okay, four wins is one thing, but it's the way they lost. All those in-game decisions that just had people pulling their hair out, and understandably. And I understand you're going to make poor decisions. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes certainly. Uh, but to when you can bank on it, it's like death, taxes, and Matt Wells is going to make some crazy decision that's going to pull the momentum from his own team to the point that where in each of the last two games, um, his, the players were complaining about or second-guessing the coaching decisions, not just his decisions, but also the, uh, the way the offense was being called. So uh, I think there should be changes. Uh, fans, big money donors... Everyone I've talked to says, well, it isn't going to get it done. Is it going to be the guy? I've actually probably taken up for more than anybody this year because of those things I said before. So, I mean, I think it's to the point to where if everybody, uh, and I don't think Matt Wells is having a good time either, uh, obviously, and thoughts and prayers out to him with him having COVID, several of the coaches, eight other members of the staff, another student athlete, Testing positive in the last week. I hope they all I hope you know that they don't their symptoms aren't uh, too severe. I've heard Wells has had some pretty bad symptoms, and I hope they they all recover. Of course, um, but I do think they should they should probably move on. Um, I think it be, might be best for all involved for new beginnings. It just didn't work. Um, so you know, if Wells comes back, I hope he nails it out of the park. You know, I hope he crushes it. Um, all of them. Wells has always treated me well, so it's definitely nothing personal. Um, and I, there are some good things to point to, but there's just so much uh, animosity between the fan base, it seems like, and towards Wells and some of those decisions and the way the program has gone. And everyone's just so tired of losing that. I think it would just be best for all involved, possibly, you know, to. To, to part ways. Final question. It also surrounds, uh, you know, the coaching situation with Texas Tech football. It comes from Prosper, who says, in regards to the football coaching fiasco, who will the board listen to, big money donors or the athletic director? Well, that's a really good question. And it's not always as cut and dried as like, okay, you know, the athletic director, Kirby Hoka and President Skubanek are supposed to, you know, they're just going to listen to what the board recommends and that's what they're going to do. That's just not the way the power structure works at every college. So, um, I, however, it's working right now because I know, boy, it was obvious in going through the coaching search before that Kirby Hoka ruled with an iron fist. Like what he said, that was the way he was going to go. And the President Skubanek, and other admin were just basically deferring to Hoka, and they had they were supporting his decision, you know, his decision to keep Kingsbury a couple of years, his decision to hire Wells when nobody, let's be honest, nobody really wanted him. Most of us haven't heard hadn't heard of him. Um, he just rammed it home, and I don't know if that's still his position. With the fact that he's had two coaches come in and not put up, not win, and then all the drama with the women's basketball program. The softball coach also resigned. Just kind of the way things have been going for Hoka. I don't know if he still rules with that kind of power. Maybe he does. I think we'll find out maybe with some of what happens here. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how that works with the what the board recommends, what Hoka does, how much support does he still have from Skunek. Just all of that. How it all shakes out. I'm just as fascinated as y'all to see how it shakes out. So, um should be another interesting week on the South Plains and in Raiderland. And, uh, you know, like I said, I just hope the coaches get healthy. Hope we get some answers. You got signing day coming up in a couple of days. Just uh, a lot going on, uh, even though the season has officially, uh, the regular season has officially ended. So great questions this week, as always. Really appreciate it. With that, I want to thank you for watching. And until next time.